very often. I would also like to say that in my work where I come from in Northwest Lower Michigan, I am a program director for an International Dark Sky Park. An International Dark Sky Park is an area of land over which the night sky has been protected from light pollution and light trespass. So there's a, an ordinance in place that governs the kind of light that can be used on this property and it's shielded and pointed down if it's needed at all. So that the human being can have an encounter with the dark, with a naturally dark wilderness, and with the stars or the clouds or the moonlight overhead. And my motive in trying to get this designation and getting the county where I live to protect this land is that this is an experience that human beings are losing. And the statistic is in the United States that almost two-thirds of the residents of the United States now live where they can no longer see the stars of the Milky Way at night. In our public school education, we don't require it of the curriculum that we teach, star names, star lore, basic constellation identification. So if you couple that idea with this reality that many, many people are losing access to seeing the stars, they don't know the names of the stars, you can see that we're losing something that's of fundamental importance to the cultural history of humanity. So protecting the night sky is not just to make a beautiful environment, it really belongs to the history of who we are and the places that we find ourselves. So that's the work that I do in Northwest Lower Michigan, and we got the designation from the International Dark Sky Association in May of 2011, but I had spent almost 10 years in my community doing work wherever I could find an audience to tell the stories of the night sky, which oftentimes took me to camps where there were children coming to you know, learn about being outdoors. And I would have a wonderful time with these children, and then I would be driving home and go through a real feeling of being let down or depressed. And it took me a while to figure out what was happening. And I realized that when we begin to talk about the stars or to think about the stars, in a certain way we leave the earth. And that if you don't prepare the earth for your return, the earth has to press down on you to get you back. And this is a literal depression that occurs. And this was a real experience that I was having. So I'd like to start there with a moment for all of us as we go through this journey that I'm going to try to lead us on, that we take a moment here at the beginning to honor the earth that is going to hold us while we take this journey. Because we think of ourselves as being in our bodies, sitting in these seats. We're at this university in this wonderful community in this country, we're on this planet, this living being that is supporting us. And to be mindful of that gesture of that being who never really asks for much attention, that we honor that. So just to take a moment and honor Earth. We will journey forth from there and come back to this place that we've prepared for our return. Now I'm gonna get behind this desk and show some images. I'll confess right here at the beginning, I prefer to not be stuck to images when I'm talking. So I have some images, but that's not really going to drive what we're talking about. The kind of broad idea that I hope to present is that there's a changing relationship between the human being and the understanding of our relationship to the starry world around us. And you can see that through history and that changing relationship, or at least the changing understanding has an effect and a consequence in the way we deal with our everyday environment and particularly with the earth. And I am also going to assume some familiarity with anthroposophy, which is the spiritual stream that informs biodynamic practices. If you're not familiar with anthroposophy, and I am using terms that you're not aware of, please stop me and ask. I, I welcome engagement so that it isn't just me talking, but that we can, at a certain point, have a conversation about trying to understand what is, what is our relationship. So with that said, I'll go back over here and press a button, and up will come this magic quote from Rudolf Steiner. Those who have insight into the secrets of the cosmos know that everything growing and thriving on the earth is an image of what shines down from the stars out of the cosmic expanse. It's a very beautiful way of saying, as above, so below. And if you looked out into the sky last night, you would have seen the mighty Orion, with Jupiter moving among the stars of Taurus, the bull Pleiades just beyond, 
the, our brightest star, Sirius, this was looking toward the southeast. But when I look into the world, where do I see Orion? Where do I see Jupiter? Where do I see Pleiades? It's not an exact impression that I'm finding here in my earthbound environment. What happens between that gesture or that position of stars and planets between where it seems like they are and they're coming here to the earth? And is it that the stars are sending forth rays down to me as a human being on the earth and that's the influence and relationship I have or is there something else that's going on? So I want to start with this idea that comes from Rudolf Steiner out of anthroposophy that there is an ongoing interchange between the earth and its cosmic environment and the human being on the earth and that cosmic environment and the earth as well. That we stand as mediators between these two realms of being. Mm -hmm. And it's our task to awaken a relationship not only to the earth beneath our feet but to the stars and the planets overhead and to find the harmony and the balance between them. So with that, I'd like to give us a picture that comes, I, I need to just get over there and see if it's squished down. Oh, it's not on my screen, it's squished. This is a calendar that comes from Michigan State University Abrams Planetarium. It's an excellent resource if you want to learn your way around the night sky. It comes out every quarter, they'll send you three months at a time. And on one side you have a map like this that shows you the stars that are overhead throughout the month. And then on the other side there's a calendar that tells you what to look for, what time of morning or night, and in what direction to look. <clears throat> so if you're new to finding your way around the night sky, this is a good place to start. They set up the calendar so that the first month will be easy. There's lines, there's, they've connected the dots for you. The next month they will populate the field with more <laughs> stars, and then the third month you have most of the visible stars, no lines, and so you're really being taken through month by month this process of exercising your capacity as a naked eye observational astronomer to get outside and look. Astronomy is remarkable as a scientific discipline because it's one of the few areas where there are more amateurs making a contribution to the discovery than any other science that we have. So it's a really citizen scientist field of discovery that's populated with, with just regular folk that want to know what is this relationship. The highest achievements of humanity throughout history can sometimes be seen as this striving to understand what have I to do with that or what has that to do with me. So starting right here on February 3rd, 2013, we were to look out in the night sky. This is what we're seeing overhead right now. We have almost directly overhead the star Capella. Capella is the brightest star in the constellation Auriga, the charioteer. In the Greek mythology, this story belongs to Zeus. Zeus, who's the son of Kronos, about whom it is told that Kronos, as a titan, will be overtaken by the Olympian gods, and Zeus is the leader of the Olympians. So he does, in the, in the Greek story, Kronos decides to eat his children. But Zeus is protected, and he's hidden away in this region with the she-goat, Capella, who supples him. In the Hindu tradition, Capella is the heart of Brahma. This is a really important star, and it's right up overhead at this time of night. And Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, which is, so for the Romans, Zeus was called Jupiter, is in that region right now. It's been moving retrograde, and it just stopped the other day, and it's now going to go direct, which means if we're looking out at it, <coughs> in the retrograde motion, Jupiter appears to be moving east, uh, westward against the background of stars, and then it will stop and appear to move eastward. That's the direct motion. So this, just to give you a little bit of an orientation of where we are, we can also see Taurus, the bull, the red star Aldebaran, which is the bull's eye, and the mighty hunter Orion, one of the most popular constellations around the world. In the month of March, Orion is visible in both the northern and the southern hemisphere, and there's a wonderful project called the Globe Project, <coughs> where citizen scientists and students and, and people are invited to go out and take a look at the constellation of Orion and count the number of stars that you can see in that region, and then you go get online and you input how many stars you have seen, and the people that organize this project can then compare light pollution around the world based on the number of stars that you can see in that constellation from the region of the world where you are. This is all an attempt to raise awareness, raise awareness. The stars are always overhead. 
It's not just a matter that when you're living in a light-polluted environment, <coughs> you're not seeing the stars. The starlight is not touching the earth in that place where you find yourself. And what difference is that making for the earth itself? Apologize, you need to. This imaginary line going around it, which we refer to as the celestial equator, and then you project that celestial equator out onto this imaginary sphere that we're at the center of. Just to give ourselves this kind of spatial dynamic of where we are. So we're at the center of this celestial sphere, and if I project this line from the center of the Earth out onto this sphere, then I can pretty easily divide the hemispheres from to northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. The solstice moments is when the sun appears to be furthest above or furthest below that celestial equator. So full out breath, I'm breathing fully out. Summer solstice, there's a pause, and then I begin to breathe in. The full in breath is the pause at winter solstice. So this is a very fundamental way to think about it, that I'm breathing out to summer solstice. When you look at the, the plant kingdom, you can see everything is beginning to grow up out of Earth and reaching toward the cosmos. And then the fruiting begins, and as it be, the ripening starts to happen, there's this coming back toward the Earth with the in-breath, and things, the plants begin to reach, you know, start to tip over toward the Earth with the weight and the heaviness, and landing on the Earth at equinox, and then coming inward, you could say, this full in-breath of the human being. Now, in ancient cultures, there was something referred to as the Great Platonic Year. It was an understanding that even though we can divide up the cycle of the year in a way that makes it sense to us, that we're dealing with something that is in a state of constant motion. Now, in order to think about things or to achieve or develop consciousness, we kind of have to fix them so that we can look at them. Like the way an accountant will take closing entries and say, okay, I'm just going to stop and look at what's been going on in my income and expenses, take a picture of that moment, and out of that moment kind of predict or recommend what we might do next. That moment only existed for the moment that I took that picture, but we use it so that we can kind of say, okay, this is going to give us an idea of what's going on. The same thing could be said about looking into the starry world. That we take a moment like this, take a picture of it, and say, okay, here's what this looks like right now. But we're moving. This is moving. We're in a constant state of motion. So if we were always thinking about that motion, we wouldn't really be able to think about it quite easily. We kinda, it gives us like, like, whoa, I think about that I'm always moving. I'm not as solidly placed on the earth. So what's happening, though, is if you're watching, you're marking the place where the sun is rising and setting each day on the horizon over years, you would see that the sun is coming slightly earlier each year to that starting point. So we'll, I'm going to introduce a few concepts and then come back to them. So the starting point, we'll say, is not one of the solstices. It's the equinox. And it's actually the vernal equinox, which comes from the word <coughs> equal night. Equinox means equal night. And it's the two days in the cycle of the year when day and night are of equal length. This is because when viewed from the Earth, we projected out the celestial, this equator of the Earth onto the celestial sphere, it appears to us that the sun is going around us, and when it comes to this point where it's crossing this equator, day and night are of equal length. If it's ascending, then now the daylight is going to grow stronger. We'll have greater daylight until we get to the moment of summer solstice where the sun is highest above the celestial equator, and then the in-breath begins, and the sun appears to come back, moving south along the horizon. We get to this point of autumn equinox. And then once the sun crosses the celestial equator at that point, then we have greater darkness until we get to winter solstice, which is the deepest, darkest time of year. Full in-breath, this pause at that breath. <coughs> and then the out-breath begins again. Today, February 3rd, or actually this weekend, February 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in the cycle of the year, we're halfway between this point and this point. We're kind of right about here. This is known as a cross-quarter day. So you can quarter the cycle of the year according to solstice and equinox, but then you can cross-quarter it by dividing each season in half. 